Thank you, everyone. I declare the meeting open at three minutes past six. On behalf of the City of Vincent, I pay my respects to the Wadjuk people of the Noongar Nation and uh, pay our respects to Elders past, present and emerging. I'd like to let members of the public gallery know that tonight we will be web streaming our meeting, but we do respect your privacy, so we don't transmit the public question time part of the meeting. Once we've finished with that, we will then start to um, live web stream. CEO, do we have any apologies or members on approved leaves, leave of absence? No, Michael. OK, we'll move to public question time. This is your opportunity to come to the microphone and speak to any item on the agenda for up to three minutes. If at the time you reach um, the three minutes and you haven't finished, you are welcome to hand over your notes to a friend or someone that has come with you. Um, alternatively, you're welcome to hand your notes up to me and I can take them on behalf of Council. Um, there is no particular order. We do just ask that you come up to the microphone, state your name, address and the item to which you are speaking tonight. So can I have the first speaker, please? ...of the meeting. So if you are joining us via the live stream, we do welcome you to the meeting. Um, also, just to let you know that we will have to have another break because tonight we do have two deputations and under policy that does require us to stop live streaming. So do apologise for the stop start this evening, but it is to protect the privacy of people speaking from the public gallery. CEO, do we have any applications for leave of absence? No, Mayor Cole, I have not received any. OK, we'll now move to deputations. We do have two this evening, both in relation to item 9.1. So at this point, we will stop live streaming. Live streaming of the meeting. And we will move to confirmation of the minutes, which is for the ordinary meeting of the 25th of July, 2017. Do I have a mover and a seconder for the minutes? Councillor Loden and Councillor Harley seconding. All those in favour, declare it carried. Now I'll move to announcements by the presiding member. I have a couple, but the main focus of this evening being the work that we're doing towards um, our Imagine Vincent campaign, which has really, over the last month, um, taken up a huge amount of our time, energy and focus as we have really ratcheted up our Imagine Vincent campaign and seeking to meet with and talk to as many residents, businesses, schools, community groups, sporting groups, um, all aspects um, and groups within Vincent. Um, we're really getting out there making sure that we are talking to all demographic groups within the city of Vincent for, our, for this campaign. It is our largest community engagement campaign to date and it will inform our 10-year community strategic plan. And that is extremely important because the community strategic plan um, will be our st chief strategic document and capture our community's <coughs> long-term vision, values and priorities. At last count, we had engaged with 700 people and we had received 2,000 thoughts, ideas and suggestions towards our Imagine Vincent campaign. But that was before a very busy weekend, so I'm not quite sure where we are at at the numbers. We probably need to go back and do a bit of a recount at this stage because on the weekend we were talking to people at the native plant sale outside the library. We had a huge day out at the Imagine Vincent Cup at Leaderville Oval um, where we saw the home team Subi Lions majestically defeat the um, West Perth Falcons and um, we will continue. We have several events planned this week. Tomorrow night we are hosting a conversation with Mount Lawley businesses. We'll be at the Mez Shopping Centre on Thursday night and then visiting a local designer retailer on Oxford Street, Mount Hawthorne. On Saturday we will be spreading ourselves across the Kayala Market, the Leadable Skate Park and a North Perth local event. So there are still other events and there's plenty of opportunities for people to engage and get involved. Um, and if you'd like more information, please go to imagine.vincent.wa.gov.au for more information about where we will be. 
And also just to mention that we have opened our 2007 garden competition. So um, we're taking entries up until the 29th of September and we do encourage everyone who loves gardening to, um, to, to submit their garden into this submission, whether it's their business garden, their front garden, their verge, whether it's a catchment friendly garden, best courtyard or balcony garden, a rear garden or a food garden, we'd really love you to consider entering. It is a fantastic and fun event. Um, there's often a bit of a tussle between councils as to who will be on the judging panel and be able to go and explore these gardens on the day because it really is a delight to see what people are doing and creating in their, in their private homes and to see some of the amazing gardens, even um, on balconies, it can be quite, quite stunning and surprising what can be achieved. So we hope you'll engage in that. Um, we'll now move to declarations of interest. I believe we have two declarations, CEO. Um, through you, Mayor Cole, uh, we've subsequently received a couple of more uh, extra disclosures from council members. The first I've received is from Councillor Matt Buckles. It's a disclosure of impartiality interest on item 18.1, partial write-off of rates. The extent of his interest is that um, Councillor Buckles' uncle is a representative of the Perth Mosque. As a consequence, there may be a perception that his impartiality on the matter could be affected. Councillor Buckles has declared that he will consider the matter on its merits and vote accordingly. The second impartiality interest disclosure I've received is from Councillor Jonathan Hallett in relation to item 12.1, the petition relating to Birdwood Square. The nature of Councillor Hallett's interest in this matter is that he lives in a uh, block a street away from the park. As a consequence, there may be a perception that his interest on the matter could be affected. Councillor Hallett has declared that he will consider the matter on its merits and vote accordingly. I've received a proximity interest disclosure from Councillor Jimmy Murphy in relation to item 10.2, proposed parking <coughs> restrictions in Broome Street, Highgate. The extent of Councillor Murphy's interest is that he is part owner of a property on Broom Street between Smith and Lord Streets. Councillor Murphy is not seeking approval from Council to participate in the debate or to remain in chambers or vote on the matter. I've also received a disclosure of proximity interest on the same item, item 10.2, from Councillor Josh Tobelberg. The extent of the interest being that Councillor Tobelberg's family owns and resides in a property within the proposed area of parking, of parking restrictions. Councillor Tobelberg is not seeking approval to participate in the debate or to remain in chambers or vote on the matter. Thank you, CEO. Um, we now come to the part of the meeting where we deal with the reports, but before we do so, we'll just move around the chamber to see if council members would like to raise any reports in addition to those already raised by the public gallery or that are marked as absolute majority decision. Councillor Hallett, do you have any further reports you wish to raise? Councillor Buckles? Councillor Gontoshevsky? Uh, just 14.2, uh, and I'm not sure if it's absolute majority, but 12.4. Yes. Um, Councillor Lowden, Councillor Toppleberg, Councillor Murphy, Nothing Councillor Harley. Me. Okay, I'd also like to um, discuss item 14.3. Um, Councillor Hallett, just to mention um, the notices of motion, we will move on block unless you wish to. You would like to flag 14.1? OK, I'll now go to the CEO to read out the items that will be moved on block this evening. Um, thank you, Mayor Cole. Council members, members of the gallery and anyone streaming at home, the items that Council will now consider adopting on block um, are as follows. Item 10.1, item 11.1 through to 11.6, inclusive. Item 12.2, item 12.3, Item 13.1. Thank you, CEO. Do I have a mover for the on-block items? Councillor Harley, seconded Councillor Hallett. All those in favour? I declare the on-block items moved. <laughs> What 
what we will now do is move to the items in the order that they were raised in the public gallery. So for those um, people streaming who weren't able to tune into public gallery, there is a bit of um, jumping around in the agenda and the reason we do that is that we we do um, deal with items first that have been raised by the public gallery and the first item this evening that was raised was item 10.3 which is a technical services item, proposed parking restrictions on Galway Street Leadable between Scott and Loftus Streets. Do I have a mover for this item? Moved Councillor Loden, seconded Councillor Buckles. Thank you Madam Mayor. Um, so. Uh, recognise the issues raised around um, parking in the street by through the petition and by the local residents, particularly advocating for the idea of uh, resident-only parking. Um, looking at the parking restrictions in that specific area in all the surrounding streets, the proposal is consistent with that, but I fully take the point that um, the issue I are concerned about is parking in the evenings rather than parking during the day. Um, I understand that you would like us to take your word for it and I, um, I wish that we could do things like that but ultimately we have to have some form of assessment to look at those, those items as well. Um, as a result I've got a, well I think it's, uh, I thought, thought it was mine but I think it's in your name, uh, Mayor Cole, around an amendment to this item which I'll, um, I'll move uh, shortly but I'll let others speak to the item first but ultimately I'm supportive of the proposed restrictions but would like to see some further consideration of how we address parking at night. Uh, thank you Mayor. Look, um, look I too am supportive of the officer recommendation um, to introduce the restrictions on the uh, as, as proposed in the agenda and also I do support the, um, the amendment on the pink if someone does raise that but I'll leave that to whoever brought that one up, um, or I'll leave it to the mover to move it after other people have spoken. Um, look, I just wanted to speak. I live quite close by to Galway Street on Burke Street, which is in a, a very similar situation with respect to um, proximity to the Leadable Town Centre, proximity to football and, and other events and public transport routes and the like. Um, and being closer to Leadable, I would suggest, is more impacted by parking restrictions, by, by parking impacts. It also has um, a number of units and the like. And, um, and, I do, and on Burke Street, the restrictions are two, 2p parking during the day and 2p on Saturday mornings. And yes, there are occasions when I come home on Burke Street, I, have to park, I only have one off-street car bay at my small home, so I park on the street with my vehicle, and there are times when I cannot find a car park on my street. However, I do take that as being part of where I live and sometimes I have to park around the corner or drive further down the street to find my way. Well, yes, occasionally muttering under my breath that it's an outrage to um, my, my life. It, it, I do, you do get that feeling sometimes and I do understand that sometimes it gets busy and it's frustrating. However, on, on balance, I think the proposed restrictions are proven to work in the location and I'm quite happy to give them every chance to see how, see how they go. Um, the rea you know, parking parking on a Saturday evening, it, it's difficult to identify why parking would be busy on a street other than parking that would otherwise have permits allocated to houses on the street, units, future units set aside which wouldn't have such permits. So, yeah, the, you know, there are occasions when parking is busy, but I do have confidence that based upon what we see in other streets, that the proposed restrictions, including the, um, the pink, um, I think are appropriate for the street. Councillors. Through you, Chair. Um, given it's been mentioned twice, I'm going to move the amendment on the gold. Do I have a seconder? Councillor Gondoshevsky. Um, I, I think it's um, fairly clear, but it has been mentioned um, twice about um, perhaps looking at this at a later date once the development goes ahead, so I think it's timely to, for us to be considering this as part of the substantive. Councillor Gondoshevsky. I'm supportive of um, the proposed amendment. I think that um, uh, I'll speak to this um, substantive up to this in terms of our consistency, but I think that um, uh, looking at this um, uh, in future, taking another look at this street in the future has strong merit. Councillor Loden. 
And so I guess uh, my, my comment on this one, I, I support the amendment as well. Um, I guess part of the point here is that this, is, this street is slightly different to some of, the, some of the ones that we do consider because it's not located near a town centre. We're not dealing with issues of commuter parking or um, people parking to go and access the town centres. This is getting, raising the concern around access to parking in the evenings. Um, so it's great that we're going to well, potentially go back and look at this again once the development's in place, but it's something that we're going to have to put some thought into going forwards as we see um, increased development along our various corridors. Uh, the area between Loftus and Oxford Street is, is an obvious one, but we will see this emerging across the city as well and probably need a broader strategy for how we will deal with these restrictions. Councillor Toppelberg. Thank you. Can I just ask a question? Um, was this, did we undertake this investigation initially in response to a request from community or was it something that was brought about from, uh, uh, from observations or from, from the officers? I'll hand over to the Director of Technical Services. Uh, through the chair, it was from the community, and just was it was the was the issue that was raised about there being issues with car parking on the street, or about car parking twenty four hours a day, or car parking in the evenings? Was the issue of the the evening parking specifically raised in the in the initial request? Do we know? Uh, through the chair, when I first had the opportunity to meet with the residents in earlier this year. Um, most of the discussion at the time was about the daytime parking <coughs> potential for TAFE students and commuters to dominate the street parkings, and then it's evolved somewhat to evenings. Just to further answer the question, um, the involvement that I've had in this issue has really been around the, requ the request for 24-hour parking restrictions and resident-only parking on the street. So. Um, wasn't involved in the early um, first contact, I believe that was with the former mayor and staff, but my contact with, with residents has been in relation to a, a request for residents only parking for 24 hours and that was the subject of the petition that was received recently. Councillors? Look, I support the amendment. Um, the reason that I support it is that I think that, as Councillor Loden has said, we do need to identify um, where the peak parking issue is happening at this particular part of Leaderville. Um, this is on the fringe in terms of the parking restrictions that are um, sort of radiating out from the town centre. So in terms of the parking restrictions that Council has put in place in streets, they have basically been moving out and Galway is at the, is at the boundary. And I think part of the other issue was that the, the section of Galway between Oxford and Scott was given TP restrictions and that wasn't carried through the whole street. But the issue from residents that I'm hearing is that this is a 24-hour issue um, and that this is not just constrained to um, daytime parking. I think that um, we really need to establish what the, what the pressure is here because we do have pressure on parking in residential streets from town centres, but in relation to this issue, we might be looking at um, pressure from apartment parking as, as um, Loftus Street is developed. So. Um, this really basically says that we understand that there's a concern about the development um, application at 161 Loftus Street. At the moment it is a vacant lot, um, but this will guarantee, if adopted, that a further survey in the evening and on weekends will be taken once that DA development, that developing, sorry, that development is completed and occupied. So I support the amendment. Any further comments, Councillor Buckles? I've actually spoken out on the amendments. I just, um, I know we're moving the amendments on the gold and there was an amendment on the pink as well. And I guess my preference is, is for the pink, but if the, if the gold gets moved, I'll leave it for whoever raised the pink to raise that one. I'm not that fussed either way. I did just want to speak just, just brief, briefly on it again. I guess, you know, if we're looking at restrictions of um, permanent restrictions, residents only, I think we can't just look at, at this street, um, Melrose Street, Stamford Street, Richmond Street, um, Bruce Street, etc. On the on the east side of Oxford Street, getting into Leederville, I mean, they don't. These are streets that are right in the heart of Leederville that don't have residents-only parking. The only street that has residents-only parking is is Car Place. So, in terms of implementing residents-only parking, I, I I can't really see how we can deal with Galway on its own. I think there are many, many streets that put up with significant, um, significant demands on the parking that residents um, 
do tolerate, despite it being very difficult to find car parks, car parks on those. And I think in Melrose Street, especially where it's 1p, um, with, with it's um, it's very very difficult to park there, and people do just carry on with life. Um, so I I just think that if we are looking at Galway in terms of the 24 hour week, um, certainly I'd be looking for us to look at the the whole of Leederville to see what could be done there. Thank you, Councillor Buckles. Any further comment on the amendment? Okay, I'll put it all those in favour of the amendment. I declare it carried. We're back to the substantive. Would anyone wish to comment further? Councillor Gondoshevsky. Thank you, Mayor. Um, look, I um, <coughs> note that the introduction of the parking restrictions in this manner is um, likely to impact on commuter parking and potentially um, address some of the concerns raised by residents in relation to um, student parking. Um, however, I note that this isn't what the residents who have spoken on this issue have been asking for. Um, We've heard that uh, what they're really after is a residence only parking zone. Um, these zones are used very rarely in the city and um, I think we need to consider that at this point that the street um, belongs to more than just the residents that live upon it. Um, I think we also need to acknowledge that this issue is likely to become an increasing, um, it is likely to increase as we um, densify. Um, however, uh, in general terms, the way that we implement our parking restriction system doesn't address this circumstance where residents on a street have more cars to be parked on the street than there are existing bays. Um, this might be something that we can look at in a future um, policy development in this space um, and um, see whether we have a capacity to address this. Um, and so I'm, I'm thankful that we've passed this amendment. Um, but I, in this circumstance, I support the current recommendation. I think it's really important when we consider parking that we think about consistency and we need to be sure that um, whilst we um, need to address the needs of residents that we live in a um, locality where parking is an issue across the locality. Um, and so I, I uh, agree with what Councillor Buckles said in relation to looking at uh, other streets in terms of evening parking. I think that this could potentially be a good use case going forward um, to allow us to consider what the appropriate response may be if, in fact, there is an appropriate response to residents parking on a street um, in their vicinity of their homes. Thank you, Councillor Gondoshevsky. Councillor Loden. Um, I'll just move the, the pink amendment. Uh, can I just clarify that um, clause two is the same as what has already been um, adopted? So uh, we're just dealing with clause three, which is to add and 8 a.m. to 12 noon Saturdays. Thank you. Do we have a seconder? Councillor Buckles. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, so I guess, yeah, just to explain that, we did it as two separate things to give opportunity to discuss them separately rather than as a combined proposal. So this effectively adds the 8 a.m. to 12 noon on Saturdays. I guess one thing to consider is that if there are um, developments going in on that street, um, the, uh, those uh, builders will be potentially operating on a Saturday and that is a challenge for the residents. It's also a time when they're probably moving in and out. So this is one way to support those, those issues as they emerge as well. I just have a question through you, Mayor, to the director of, to Acting Director of Technical Services um, uh, in relation to... Oh, are you the seconder? Sorry. Councillor Buckles, did you wish to speak as the seconder? OK, go ahead, Councillor Gondoshevsky. Apologies, Councillor Buckles. Right. I, I thought I had the go-ahead from the Mayor. It was, it was a chair <laughs> error. Go ahead. Um, I understand the concerns in relation to the um, building and I just wondered whether the city had um, implemented parking <coughs> restrictions um, primarily designed to address um, building trades in other areas uh, where we've seen uh, apartment development? Uh, through the Chair, not specifically uh, to protect residents, more to control the builder's activity and that could extend to construction zones and you know, other restrictions to prevent them uh, impinging on the, the surrounding businesses and residents, but not specifically for the residents' benefit in respect to parking availability. Uh, and just one follow-up question. I note if this is a vacant lot, are those, have those restrictions typically been introduced um, prior to development occurring or um, in line with that development? And are they time restricted or duration restricted? Thank you. 
uh, through the chair that um, development related and the times are specific to um, standard working hours. So, for example, a construction zone would be 7 a.m. to 7 p.m., Monday to Saturday, and then it would be free and available to everybody else outside those hours. Through you, um, Mayor. Um, I know it seems like splitting hairs, but I'm not going to support the amendment on the pink. And my reasons for doing so, which Councillor Gontrzewski has um, kind of, I guess, segued into, is the reasons, one of the reasons why we're putting restrictions in place. And I have um, even some reservations ab about that and the flow on effect to other streets particularly as you go up Tennyson and so on and so on, is there is no development application before us at the moment. So we're actually now trying to make rules for a vacant lot. And I just... I, that's not the rationale for why we need these... Councillor Harley, I'm, sorry? I'm so sorry to interrupt. I just want to clarify that there has been an approval for the DA on the site, sorry, but my, it just hasn't commenced. It hasn't, hasn't commenced. commenced. Okay. So I do think that we need to deal with the parking issues as they arise and not try and preempt the problems, uh, because that also sets a precedent for what happens across the rest of the city. Um, I have great reservations about placing... I've, I've, uh, I will be voting um, for the substantive... But I have great reservations about placing more and more and more restrictions, as we know that the very next pattern of events is that the surrounding streets then come to us um, seeking restrictions and seeking resident-only um, permits. So what I think that we ought to do is to not jump at shadows, not preempt problems where there are not existing problems, and deal with the parking issues as they arise once development, um, once development commences in advance, so the city are able to have discussions in advance with the builder and developer based on our history of other developments and try and preempt some of those issues and try and prevent some of those issues. But I do think if we are approving developments, then we can't also, by the same token, say, and by the way, you can't be parking cars in this <coughs> vicinity or we're going to come and ticket you. I think we have to find a better solution um, I understand the residents' um, residents' concerns on this, but I don't support this amendment at this stage. Councillor Loden and then Councillor Topperberg. Have you a uh, question? Just a question um, uh, through to the Director of Technical Services. Would the introduction of 8 a.m. to 12 p.m. be broadly consistent with the parking restrictions in the neighbouring uh, streets of Burke, Scott and Tennyson Street? Uh, through the chair, that would be correct, yes. Councillor Toppelberg. Thank you. Just a quick question to the Director of Development Services. I'm sure I wasn't expecting a question on this item. Um, in relation to construction management plans, in the event that somebody wishes to proceed with construction <coughs> and there are parking restrictions in all of the surrounding streets, what's the City's usual practice in terms of uh, issuing permits or otherwise for uh, reasonable uh, trades parking to be able to access the site? Uh, through you, Michael, I, I can take that one. Um, the city does um, have the ability to provide temporary parking permits, um, and we quite often do for uh, tradespeople associated with approved developments. Uh, that is carefully controlled in terms of how many are allocated um, per site and also the, the days and times that those permits are applicable for. Councillor Toppenberg? I'll just speak briefly. I'll support the amendment. I think that it's consistent with what's in the surrounding neighbourhood, but I think that the answer for me is quite simple. When people come and ask us to introduce parking restrictions to stop development happening in areas where people have development approval, ultimately this is the nature of living on streets. If you can't provide all of the parking required for your business, residence or otherwise uh, within your lot, whatever that may be, we have the public space and the public realm and it's our responsibility to manage that, but I think that the idea of introducing restrictions to specifically stop people being able to access developments to work on it... I, don't agree with it all, but I'm happy to support the amendment given it's consistent with the surrounding, uh, the surrounding restrictions. Councillors, look, I will just comment that I do support the amendment given that it's consistent with um, with streets within the area. It's not it's not consistent with the lower part of Galway Street, but this this particular section of Galway Street is 
is more narrow and does have quite a significant amount of no stopping yellow marking so that traffic um, parking on this part of Galway Street is relatively limited as a result of the yellow um, marking um, no stopping lines. Um, of 33 houses fronting Galway Street there's approximately 26 on-road parking spaces so there's actually less on-road parking spaces even if it was um, de you know, determined that residents should be entitled to have one bay per household which is not a practice that the City of Vincent um, subscribes to. It just demonstrates that this is actually um, not a, a part of a, a part of Galway Street where there's not um, an excessive amount of parking given the no stopping marking. So um, not all homes have access to parking on, on road outside their homes and, and as a result if there is a development being built with a number of trades attending all at one time I can see that it would have a significant impact on the availability of parking on this section of Galway Street. So I do support the amendment. Any further comment? Okay, I'll put the amendment. All those in favour? I declare it carried. We're back to the substantive. Excuse me, Mayor. I didn't... Oh, I... sorry, sorry, Councillor Harley. Apologise. All those in favour? All those against? I declare it carried. Councillor Harley voting against. Back to the substantive. Are there any further comments? Okay, look, I will just make some comments around the um, the request for residents only parking. This is something that the city has um, done in very um, extreme cases in the past, but has actually begun to move away from given that parking in the public domain is at such high demand. It was demonstrated that residents only parking actually as a tool for managing parking in an area has has actually not um, has not worked well and has where we where we have had that um, it's it's simply not been something that the city has has opted to go to go with and to continue to do, given that um, it means that where you have businesses um, pop up, etc., as we have seen with businesses like Chinta, it's created um, issues around parking flow and parking turnover in those areas. It is also, I think, creates expectations within the community that public parking is exclusively there for residents and unfortunately, given the um, limited car parking that we do have within the City of Vincent as we continue to grow and densify, that's simply something that the City can no longer, um, not that we ever have guaranteed that, but the more that we densify, the less that that um, proposition becomes um, a reality. Um, in relation to um, what's causing the issue here, I do think that the city does need to investigate causes of, um, of peak occupancy on our streets, that it's not only about, as the director called it, leisure parking um, in Leaderville. It can also be tied to um, more density along our corridors. It can also be related to commuters. It can be related to a highly active use. We do find, for example, if you live near a school, you're going to find extreme um, parking issues at certain peak times of the day. So there's various issues that cause parking um, bottlenecks within our community, and we do as a council need to start to identify that. But one of the key issues is that we, we can't, we, and we know this from the work that we've recently done in North Perth, where we surveyed not only the North Perth Town Centre but the surrounding residential streets, and we took an approach to parking which was really whole scale, that we looked not only at town centre restrictions but we also um, looked at the um, radius of residential roads around North Perth and we put in place parking <coughs> restrictions of various um, timed um, lengths of time around the town centre at the time that we put in restrictions in the town centre because we've recognised as a council that an ad hoc approach on a street by street basis is not the way to go and that we do need to look at where parking restrictions are um, introduced, that we look at the flow on effects and that we understand that we need to have some sort of equity across the board and a, and a, and a fair approach to how we deal with this. It is based on occupancy rates and it is based on um, data so those things are important to the council and when we make decisions we do need to, to factor that in. So in terms of the restrictions, I understand the residents won't be fully satisfied with what's proposed, but what we are voting on tonight are restrictions during um, 8 to 5.30 p.m. Monday to Friday and 8 a.m. to 12 noon on Saturdays with a commitment to residents that we will resurvey in the evenings and on um, Saturdays and Sundays once that development at um, 161 Loftus Street has has been built and occupied. So 
I um, hope that we will see some difference with the um, with the uh, implementation of these restrictions, and we will certainly continue to look at this. And in terms of looking at it, we will need to look at surrounding streets and look at that from a much more holistic approach across Leederville, as, as Councillor Buckles highlighted earlier in his comments. Any further comments? Okay, I'll put the substantive. All those in favour? I declare it carried unanimously. Okay, we'll move on now to item 12.1, which was the second item raised from the public gallery this <coughs> evening, which is a petition for a multi-purpose court at Birdwood Square, Perth. It's a community engagement item. Do I have a mover for this item? Councillor Gondoshevsky, seconded Councillor Toppelberg. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I would like to acknowledge um, Bruce, the lead petitioner, and um, all the people who signed the petition um, requesting a multi-purpose facility uh, at Birdwood Square. Um, I can uh, understand uh, that Mr Dainton has, um, was concerned that he was not contacted prior to um, this item coming back to council, and I um, just wanted to check through you, Mayor, to the Director of uh, Community Engagement um, in relation, to, or perhaps to the CEO, in relation to petitions, um, what the standard practice is um, in terms of providing information to um, the respondents or the, the signatories or lead petitioner. Uh, through you, Mayor Cole, in relation to uh, this particular report, the Acting Manager of uh, Community Partnerships um, did indeed contact the lead petitioner late last week to let him know that uh, this report was coming to Council. Um, so I can um, confirm that that was the case. Can I just ask a follow-up question in relation to that? Was there any thought given to notifying or contacting the lead petitioner prior to the briefing session? Uh, through you, Mayor Cole, um, in hindsight that would have been preferable prior to the briefing session rather than the council meeting and that was an oversight on administration's part. Um, having said that, based on the conversations at the briefing session last week, it is administration's intention to meet with the lead petitioner to talk through not just the outcomes that have been recommended by administration but more so um, providing him with the context around the public open space strategy um, and indeed the fact that the analysis did identify that there is potentially a gap within this part of the city in relation to the provision of, of hard courts. So whilst I can appreciate the lead petitioner's sentiments tonight, um, the intention is really to look at this in a more of a broader scale given the fact that it is a um, best part of a quarter of a million dollar project potentially that does require um, further planning. So I can confirm that administration's intention is to meet with the lead petitioner, talk him through the desktop analysis and then more importantly talk him through the public open space strategy and what that will potentially mean to the provision of um, multi-purpose courts or similar in this part of Vincent. Thank you Director. Back to you Councillor Gondoshevsky. Thank you Mayor and thank you Director. Um, I. Uh, I, just, I think I would just want to say that I can um, acknowledge the petition and um, can assure um, Mr Dainton and, and also the petitioners that uh, despite the recommendation not to proceed with such a facility at this stage, uh, that there has been a significant and serious consideration of this proposal. A lack of facilities has been identified from the work undertaken, um, but whether there is the demand for full court facilities that would justify the development of the open space at a likely cost of around $200,000 um, is not uh, clear to me, particularly as it appears that um, many basketball league games tend to be played indoors. Um, However, this has been a valuable work to do and will be further built upon by the city delivering our public open space strategy this year. Part of this process will be to understand the expectations of our community in availability of sporting and recreational facilities in our area. So I recognise this will be disappointing to petitioners at this stage, but I'm satisfied with the consideration of this matter in response to the petition and I'm supportive of the officer recommendation. Councillor Toppelberg. Uh, just my only comment is in relation to, I didn't see this as a rebuke of the idea or otherwise, I saw it as an analysis of what 
the cost would be and an open admission that we have not properly analysed our open space. And whilst we recognise that there's a broad shortage in the city, that something like this it would be uh, unreasonable to consider until we've uh, properly assessed um, the, uh, the demand and uh, the levels of service that we wish to provide through our open space strategy. So I, uh, whilst I understand the concerns uh, that have been raised um, by Mr Dainton, I think that they uh, there's probably a misalignment and that certainly seems to be a communication issue more so than actually a, uh, an, an issue of, uh, of um, the, the substance of the matter and my reading of it was that um, yes the idea is there this is approximately what it would cost and when we know exactly where we need these sorts of things we'll come back and have another look at it and this may well be a location for it or, or otherwise so I'm happy to support the officer recommendation. Thank you councillors. No further comment. Okay. Look, I will just comment. I do take. I, I do think that the way in which the motion's written is a little blunt, and perhaps could have been um, written slightly differently to just really acknowledge that the the report does talk about the fact that there is a, um, a shortfall of this type of facility in this area of Vincent, and that is definitely noted by administration and this council. And um, I, I believe that this, as, as Councillor Topperberg says, this is, this is um, basically saying that at this point we do have a body of work that's happening this financial year. We're not trying to seek to push this off into the never-never, but we are actually doing our um, public open space strategy this financial year where we will be um, dealing with and grappling with these issues. So this is not something that's... Um, that's something that's far off um, and never to be spoken of again, but it is something that's very imminent in terms of the body of work that we're doing around um, the need for such facilities. Um, it is recognised that there is a shortfall in the area. We have, um, we're, we're a little unclear on what Highgate Primary School's plans are exactly around a multi-purpose multi court and what their reinstatement will be and what what um, what type of facility that will be. Um, the, as Councillor Gondry Krzyzewski said there has been issues raised from um, Department of Sport and Rec around what they see um, as a useful um, multi-purpose court in terms of they seem to favour indoor courts. So um, in terms of the City of Vincent actually going forward and seeking some support through the um, CSRFF shed grant um, proposal, um, we would need to work further with the community to establish um, the need, whether um, this facility would be used on an ad hoc basis by community members or whether it would actually be attached to a local sporting group. So. Um, and what sort of funding we could seek through the state government for something like this. So there is um, quite a body of work to do and I'm, I believe that um, this, this will now happen and that there will be further discussion with Mr Dainton and um, the work that we will be doing through our open space strategy will seek to address this need and also have um, further information from Highgate Primary School about what um, is actually going to happen on the school grounds there because at this point we have been told that courts are likely to be reinstated but we're not sure when and in what format. So there is um, quite a few question marks around uh, what provision there will be there. So for the time being, I do um, apologise, Mr Dainton, that you were advised um, later than we would have hoped. That That's something that um, I'm, I'm sorry that that happened and I'll be more than happy to discuss this with you further with staff. Um, so please don't see this as an end to a great idea, but something that will be considered um, as we go through our public open space strategy development. Excuse me, may I ask a question in regards to the courts at Sacred Heart? Um, primary, whether the council uh, administration has engaged with them at all about making those courts accessible, or if there is an outright rejection of that idea or a potential partnership. Uh, through you, Mayor Cole, I'm not aware of any uh, recent conversations, but it's certainly a conversation that administration have started in the first instance with the Department of Education around um, public schools and their accessibility, not just to sports courts, but to their playing fields and, and other areas as well. That is certainly a key element, if not of the public open space strategy, just a, a body of work that administration needs to look at before we start providing new infrastructure in our public open spaces, get an understanding of what infrastructure we can access on, whether it be private or public school land. So certainly there are discussions that need to be um, held, but um, certainly in the last 
last 12 months, I'm not aware that they've been held with that school. Okay. Councillors, any further comments or questions? Okay, I'll put the substantive. All those in favour? I declare it carried. Okay, we're moving on now to item 9.1 in development services. Thank Number 143 Edward Street, Perth. Change of use from showroom and office to drop-in centre. Unlisted use and office, including alterations. Do I have a mover? I'll move. Moved Councillor Harley. Seconded Councillor Hallett. Um, thank you, Mayor. Firstly, um, I want to acknowledge the residents and business concerns that have been articulated here tonight and um, commend uh, both the people who made the deputations. Um, respectfully, though, I don't agree with the concerns that have been raised about the drop-in centre. Um, and I do that for a range of reasons. My, um, my first connection with homelessness issues started when I was a 15-year-old high school student and it has remained incredibly strong. Um, fortunately, on the, in the City of Vincent, we are a great supporter of community services and we are proud supporters of those services. And they include Mission Australia, um, Palmerston Street, the Oxford Foyer, um, Manor Inc, Salvation Army, um, Assertive Outreach, Noongar Patrol, um, the Bridge, there's uh, Women's Refuges, there's a, a number of community um, centres and services within the City of Vincent. Um, th and they are there for both historical reasons and they are there also because we are an inner city council. Um, and homelessness, we've just had Homelessness Week just a few weeks ago um, and it is a growing problem and one that councils must be part of the solution with as well as state government, federal government and the non-government sector and community members themselves. Homelessness is one of the pre-indicators to incarceration and that is a problem you've maybe read about in the newspapers recently, particularly with our young people. So I guess I, I want to address a couple of the issues that have been raised. I am not, I, there is no evidence to say that antisocial behaviour or violence will increase. There is a lot of evidence though to show that people who are homeless, particularly young people, are some of the most vulnerable people we have in society and they are at great risk of violence being done to them. They are also at risk of either having exacerbated mental, poor mental health outcomes or homelessness being the trigger for poor mental health outcomes um, and of course um, medical, uh, poor medical outcomes as well. So one of the reasons for, I guess, choosing this area is because as an inner city area, um, Homeless people gravitate to inner city areas. This is a fact of life um, in all urban centres. Um, I do find an interesting juxtaposition about the brothels because I would welcome a delegation every single council meeting to ask us to monitor them and to close those down. I just can't accept that they are a reason for not having a drop-in centre. They are an issue, I, I agree, but they, they can't, I cannot in good conscience agree that that is a reason for not having a drop-in centre for young people. Um, I sat on a committee two doors down from a, a very, very busy brothel at the Welfare Rights and Advocacy Service. The businesses and residents along there actually co have coexisted for a very long time in a quite eclectic, um, a quite eclectic area. Um, I do acknowledge the concerns and fears that residents and businesses have and, um, and I have um, spent quite a bit of time when we were dealing with the Mission Australia issue in Palmerston Street talking to residents and businesses. Um, those concerns have not been realised actually um, and I, I, I acknowledge them but I also ask for you to work with this um, drop-in centre um, and to approach it with an open heart and an open mind. Similar concerns were raised about Oxford Foyer because they have vulnerable youth and at-risk youth. I'm not aware of any issues that have been raised in and around that area and it's an area that I frequent um, a lot. So the overriding message I hear is not there. My question is then where is that going to go? 
Where else in the City of Vincent is that going to go? Where else in the City of Perth? It's already in the City of Perth. They haven't been able to find a location. Where else in the City of Vincent is it going to go? And whether it's City of Vincent or Perth, wherever it ends up, and I do hope it ends up in the City of Vincent, and I will do f with your service what I've done with all the other services, and I'll make the time to go and visit them, and where possible put in some volunteer hours as well to help um, do my bit to help that service succeed. Um, but it is our responsibility as a council, and that means we share that responsibility um, as a community. And I would ask my fellow councillors to support this, and I would ask that those residents and businesses um, in the room tonight, and thank you for taking the time to come here, approach this with an open heart and an open mind because we desperately need these types of services for vulnerable young people. It is absolutely imperative, and um, that's all I've got to say. Councillor Hallett. Thank you, Mayor. Through you to the um, Director of Development, not Development, sorry to ski, um, to Community Engagement. Um, just a quick question. Would you be able to just respond to um, the issue raised in the gallery around the antisocial behaviour at World Square and I guess the, what that has looked like, but where is that now in terms of recency of complaints and things? Uh, yes, through you, Mayor Cole. Administration has been providing a, a, a quarterly report to Council at Council's request since uh, the decision was made last November to continue Manor Inc services at Weld Square. Uh, the uh, public gallery was correct in the sense that there is about 250 meals served every single day, um, or six days a week, I should say, at Weld Square. Having said that, we have been monitoring uh, the antisocial behaviour through police reports, ranger reports, um, and reports from Noongar Outreach Services. Um, and in the two last quarterly reports, uh, there have been no reported instances of um, antisocial behaviour from NOS rangers or police. There have been some, um, a couple of incidents reported by Manor Inc themselves. Uh, one of those was in relation to uh, the behaviour of um, some people when receiving meals, but that was um, uh, managed quite quickly and quite effectively. And the other complaint was in relation to surrounding um, building sites and some of those workers actually um, accessing um, meals from the Manor Inc service. So they've been the only two issues reported to uh, the city um, in the last six months. Uh, so, uh, at least based on the advice and the work that administration has um, put into this, uh, there is no um, causal link necessarily between uh, the Manor Inc and the Homelessness um, Food Service and antisocial behaviour at Wells Square. Thank you. Um, I guess just a, a couple of comments. Um, I think it's, it's unfortunate that in, in many ways the local government is unable to address the causes of homelessness, um, the major causes, um, but we do bear a significant responsibility for responding to the issues that then arise um, and also in delivering really important services to help transition um, homeless folks into um, care or emergency accommodation, etc. Um, I guess one point around if, if this is approved, um, notwithstanding I guess the, the good work that the city is already doing in this space, um, I think it would be good to have some more conversations about the challenges of homelessness, given that this is it's a different group that um, a lot of the residents have talked about um, that are having issues at the moment to the folks that will be coming to the drop-in centre. Um, but how can we perhaps uh, maximise our ability to coordinate services um, across Vincent to respond to um, reducing homelessness overall? Um, it, this is a difficult one, and I think my... The reason why I do support this, um, the recommendation from the officers is that I'm not sure that there are many other locations that are appropriate for a service like this. I think it is actually really difficult to find um, locations for youth services. I've been involved previously in trying to locate premises for youth services and it's a really hard balance between finding a venue that has appropriate space and facilities in a location that's easily accessible for the clients and also provides some level of discreteness and privacy for them as well. Um, I think we need to remember that these young people are seeking out help um, and have an incentive not to be disruptive um, in terms of maintaining the service access um, and they're also part of our community as well so we need to consider the health of all of our inhabitants um, which includes these folks 
um, as well. And I guess just lastly, I think I have a lot of respect for the folks that work in this area, um, and I think we need to trust the expertise of those running the services and their management plans and service delivery processes, which minimise impacts on neighbouring properties. And it was previously housed in a medium density residential area, and the advice we've had is that there's very few complaints um, in relation to that. And so, in a, a mixed residential and commercial spot like this, um, it seems like um, probably one of the better spots that we could have it in. Thank you, Councillor Hallett. Any further comments, councillors? Councillor Toppelberg. Thank you. Um, look, I, <laughs> the, th the key thing for me here is this is, a, this is a planning application. This isn't a commentary on homeless services or otherwise. This is a planning application for uh, for a service. Uh, and for me, one of the uh, and I've asked about it for a couple of weeks, and I'm still a little bit stuck on it. And so I will ask the question again. I have no issue with the management plan in terms of, uh, or the management of the building and the premises itself. I think the comparisons, if we just take Mission Australia at Palmerston Street, it's an unfair comparison because by the nature of that management plan, all of the people who attend there are actually brought to there in a vehicle. Uh, that it's not a drop-in centre, it's not an open centre. They're brought at a particular time of, between particular hours of the, the night. As far as I'm aware, that was certainly, it may be operating differently, but it was specifically for um, people to be brought to that facility uh, for the services. Uh, so it, it was by appointment, uh, or at the time it was with notification if there wasn't space for people at the facility, they're taken elsewhere at that point. It's not somewhere where people uh, just drop into or, or attend. Uh, likewise, with uh, if we talk about Oxford Foyer, um, again, whilst they're providing youth services for, uh, for at-risk and, and troubled youth, they're also the nature and the way in which people uh, access these services is different to a drop-in centre. My questions and I have, again, I have no issue with the management plan or with what's proposed to happen on site during the operating hours. My questions or my concern is that there's nothing, there's no real, and I think the answer was given by the Director of Development Services uh, when I asked the question previously, <laughs> there's no real responsibility that, that can be taken on other than, uh, I suppose, the general responsibility that we have as, as a community or that um, that community or other services have if people attend uh, for whatever reason a refused entry or whether it be numbers or otherwise or if people are there before or after hours there is no uh, element of the management plan that, that can cater to it and I guess the concern that the local community uh, uh, are saying loud and clear is what happens to these people Wh where do they go to by nature if uh, people are accessing homeless services uh, they have limited uh, options in terms of where where they can go to so and I will ask the question in terms of in the event that somebody is refused access to the facility uh, or they, uh, for whatever reason, if it's, they're outside of hours or otherwise, what responsibility do the local community, does the city of Vincent, do our rangers, do police, do, uh, do this service, what responsibility do we have to ensure that people are uh, looked after and how, how, is, how does the management plan address any of those issues? Um, through you, Mayor Cole. Um, as I said, as I said last week, um, the operators don't have any responsibility for homeless youth outside of those that access their service. Um, I think the the advice from the City of Perth in relation to the the two complaints that they've received in the last however many years, um, but as far as they've got records for, um, the the complaints they received were about um, homeless youth who had um, used the surrounding area to, um, to sit and wait for the service. Um, in those instances, um, once Passages was made aware of those complaints, they spoke to those young people who were accessing their services. And none of this is required by the management plan, and, and nor should it be. It sits separate to this application. But nevertheless, they spoke to those young people, and there's been no complaints of that loitering by young people actually ac um, accessing the service since. So um, there's certainly a, an obligation for the operator of the service, the City of Vincent, um, and the community to work with people who are causing concern for other members of the community and, and work with them to ensure that they're not creating those concerns. And that's exactly what's happened um, with the drop-in centre at the City of Perth. And um, that's certainly the relationship the City will be um, looking to have with passages if this application is approved. Um, and 
it's certainly something that the city is, in, is investigating and working on continuing to provide support for homeless people in the community um, in whatever way we can to try and minimise the, um, the concerns that the community has um, regarding that issue. Councillors? Okay, look, I'll make some comments on the application. Um, in terms of the um, dealing with it as a, as a development application and looking at where the council has, um, has uh, discretion that we're being asked to exercise, um, the critical issue is the land use, which is an unlisted use. Um, the other um, issues where we're being asked to exercise discretion have, have effectively been conditioned, so that's in rela relation to um, bicycle bays, um, the ground floor design where we have the, ref the current um, building has reflective glazing, uh, that has been conditioned, external fixtures, fixtures, that's about the air conditioner location which has been conditioned, and landscaping, um, it, it, doesn't, it won't meet the full requirement of the new built form policy but this is an existing building and they, um, the, that is also partially conditioned so that a landscape architecture plan is required to ensure that as the maximum amount of tree canopy can be um, achieved on that, on that site. So in, in relation to what council is dealing with it really does come down to the land use and then I think that discussion around what sort of service is appropriate in this location is a valid one to be having here tonight. Um, is a drop-in centre a compatible land use in an R80 zoned residential commercial in a city area? That's the question that I'm considering. Um, and I note, it's, I think that whenever we have um, submissions, we've had 91 submissions of which 86 have objected and we have had some regular contact from of those um, submitters who do have concerns and have come to us and voiced their um, concern about the sorts of antisocial behaviour that they are experiencing and they they do worry that this will um, exacerbate the issue. So I, I, I listen to that and, and take it all very seriously and um, it's not something that's simply dismissed. We know that people that live and work in the area know their area and they, and they experience it on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, my main... Um, my main uh, reason for supporting the application is that I think that passages is a proven is a proven um, service. They have operated in Palmerston Street, and this is where the direct comparison has come between what's happened in Palmerston Street versus potentially what we foresee happening in Edward Street, is that this, this is a service that has been running for 18 years, and that when we have gone to the City of Perth and and fact-checked on complaints and, and had, the, had the sort of deeper discussion about what level of complaints there have been. Um, we, we see that there, the complaints, there were two complaints in 2016 and as, as St Vincent de Paul has um, acknowledged in their, in their delegation to us this evening that whenever there is a complaint they have acted and they have resolved the complaint and that has ceased to be an issue. So. Um, I, I do feel that given that this is a proven service um, that where they have demonstrated that they can meet um, their operational requirements under a strict management plan where they have a very high staff to young person ratio and are demonstrating that the people that are accessing the service are those young people who um, are not um, necessarily grappling with severe drug issues but are those that are actually wanting to get on the right path and actually start to job seek and actually try to um, turn their lives around. So these are people who are coming to passages because they want to actually take steps. They're not simply in a um, in a situation where they're not wanting to turn their homelessness around. So these are um, probably people that are experiencing homelessness but are at the proactive side of actually trying to get out from that and access this service for those reasons. We've heard about the fact that they are very responsive to, um, to the staff in terms of doing the right thing by the service and that they do um, not want to cause the, the service to have complaints made against it. I do think that um, a youth drop-in centre can be a compatible use going forward. I think that as this area revitalises and that there is more um, development, that this is the sort of um, 
service that can continue to to grow and thrive in this area and I think that 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 will be something um, that that won't be an issue as, as the area densifies I mean we're all really hoping that the concrete batching move, plants move out so that we can see more of that happening um, also just in relation to um, the city of Vincent in terms of tackling issues we are we are aware of homelessness in our community and we do strive to deal with issues when they come to us and we're confronted by them and I think World Square is an example of where we don't simply support Manor Inc but where there are issues we do seek to deal with them and that we do have the difficult conversations and talk about where things aren't working and how they can be fixed and that was where we saw the meal service move to a lunchtime service. We have a, an ongoing partnership with Noongar Outreach Services. Um, we have recently funded St Bart's emergency accommodation to provide additional beds at St Bart's and we're looking also at, I believe it's Red Sky Laundry, to provide some um, employment opportunities for housing, uh, sorry, for, for homeless people. So we don't simply um, look at these issues from afar. We do roll our sleeves up and, and try to take an active role in homelessness within within um, the city of Vincent. And just in a final point, I do, I do understand that there are um, significant antisocial er issues that are, that are being dealt with um, by, um, by the people who are working and living in the area. But I do take the point that Vinnie's in moving into this area is seeking to be part of the solution, that they have the connections to outreach services, and that in moving into the area, they are seeking to deal with homelessness, not to increase homelessness. So that is also one of the reasons why I'm supporting this application. Councillors, are there any further comments? Okay, I move the motion. All those in favour? Excuse me, Mayor. Yes. Can, may I have right of reply? Oh, yes, of thank course. You. Yeah. Thank, thank you um, and for everyone's comments. I just wanted to um, touch on a few things. And um, the, Councillor Topberg's right. This is a, a development application, absolutely. I can't separate myself out from it being a DA um, for land use and um, it being a commentary on homelessness for me. They're just one and the same with this application. I'm in front of us and um, I did feel the need to make a commentary on homelessness because City Vincent um, are so involved. And the reason why um, Mission Australia was a comparison and that, because it was one of the places where we really, the community really were anticipating um, a lot of issues. Those young people are not taken there of their own free will as opposed to going into a place like Passages. They actually picked up by police primarily off the street as well as youth social workers. They often are picked up by very angry and irate parents who didn't want to be called out in the middle of the night. They are often um, children who have outstanding warrants and other um, multitude of issues. So it is one of the places that if we thought there were going to be problems, that would have been one of the places where um, we would see them. And Councillor Hallett, you're right in regards to um, the challenges of homelessness. I think the City of Vincent, um, more so than many other councils, actually punches well above our weight. Um, and we are seeing um, an issue at the moment with more issues coming to Vincent because of, um, in my personal opinion, a lack of work going on in the City of Perth and, a, and, a, uh, and pushing um, homeless and street present um, people out into the City of Vincent. So we are seeing a few more issues in the adult space um, with that. And um, I once again, I support the um, application and I wish everyone well. Thank you. I'll put the motion. All those in favour? Declare it carried unanimously. Um, we're moving on now to development services item 9.2, which is number 53 to 65 Wasley Street, number 90 Forest Street, North Perth, amendment to existing approvals, independent living units and nursing home. Home. Do I have a mover for this item? Councillor Buckle seconded Councillor Toppleberg. Um, I'll just speak briefly. I'm pretty comfortable supporting this item. I think it's um, quite a sensible way forward to uh, deal with sort of a little anomaly. Thank you. Councillors, any further comments? 
Okay, I'll put the motion. All those in favour? <coughs> Declare it carried unanimously. Okay, we'll now deal with the absolute majority decisions, and that is item 12.4, Proposed Parking and Parking Facilities Amendment Local Law 2017. Do I have a mover for this item? Councillor Gondoshevsky, seconded Councillor Toppelberg. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, look, in, uh, the City is undertaking reviews of a um, number of local laws this year. Um, this. Uh, Proposed parking and parking facilities amendment local law um, relates to how we manage um, parking in the city. Um, I, in general, I am supportive of the um, amendments that are proposed to be included um, in the proposed um, uh, amended local law. Um, I do have some concerns in relation to a particular um, section of the um, proposed amended local law, um, which I would like to draw your attention to, um, if you will cast your eyes towards um, clause 8.8, .8, um, which deals with obstruction in a public place or thoroughfare. I, um, uh, I have some concerns in relation to um, the city implementing um, the components of this clause um, in relation to um, uh, clause 8.82C. Uh, so 2A, um, where um, it uh, basically says that parking legally in a place where you can park for more than 24 hours would be considered to cause an obstruction. Um, an obstruction under this local law has a $135 penalty and it also talks about impounding vehicles. So um, I'd like to put forward an amendment. Um, it is on the uh, blue. Um, that 8.82a is deleted, um, and if I can get a seconder, I would um, happily tell you all about it. I'll second, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Harley. Um, look, um, this uh, clause, um, the first part of this clause talks about um, uh, not leaving a, par leaving a vehicle um, in a public place so that it obstructs the use of that public place. And if you're going to do that, you need to get um, permission of a local government or a written law. No problems with that. Um, section 2 um, of this um, section actually talks about um, what is deemed to cause an obstruction. Um, and uh, working up from the current, it basically says, it's deemed to cause an obstruction if a vehicle is abandoned, unregistered or disused. Cool. It's deemed to cause an obstruction if it is not um, parking in accordance with signs. Cool. Um, and it's also deemed to cause an obstruction uh, if it's parked for any period exceeding 24 hours um, unless you've got permission from the local government. And I don't think that's very cool. Um, I understand that at least part of the motivation for this clause um, may have come from the city receiving complaints about um, people, their neighbours parking on streets when they go to work on a FIFO basis. And I guess the reason I would like to have this discussion um, in a public forum is, is I'm not quite sure what's so bad about that. Uh, whether you're a FIFO worker or a person who keeps their car for weekend or weekday use only, or a resident who has house guests that have driven in from out of town, I'm not sure um, that we want to be telling people that they're breaking the local law and under this proposed clause they will be um, and risk themselves getting a $135 fine or having their vehicle impounded um, or it will be if the city's doing its job because section 1.8 of this local law says that the city can prohibit or regulate parking but we must do so consistently within the provisions of the local law. So I guess my concern is that um, essentially under this local law, if someone parks their car on the street for more than 24 hours, their neighbour doesn't like it and rings the council. If we're implementing this local law consistently, that person should get a fine. And I think I understand in, um, that um, 
The intent of the subclause is not to impound or infringe vehicles. This is from the administration's comment in relation to the um, amendment. It's not the intended to impound or infringe vehicles parked legally on residential streets. Um, but the intention that if we remove this subclause, a vehicle may be parked in a public space for an unlimited period of time as long as it's parked illegally and not deemed to obstruct the use of that public space. And I guess if the vehicle's parked legally, it's not abandoned or disused. It's not parked against um, the, in contravention of a sign, and it's not obstructing the public space. I'm not really sure that we're there at that point where we're telling people that they can't do it. And one of the big complaints that I have heard, not necessarily about this local government, but about you know potential local government, is arbitrary and inconsistent decision making, where one person gets infringed, or you know because of one perceived reason and then another person gets let off or that we and I, so I think consistency is um, quite important to me I think we need to have systems that are flexible and provide support but I think that the um, I think that clause one actually strengthens the current provisions um, of section 8.8 .8, and I think that um, clause two um, B and C um, certainly provide clarification, um, but I think that Clause A actually leaves us open to um, inconsistent um, implementation, and as such, I think we should remove it. Thank you. How could I possibly follow that? <laughs> Give it your best go. I have nothing further to add. Councillor Toppelberg. Thank you. Um, so I know it's a crude measure, but local laws sometimes are. Um, just to confirm, it does actually uh, it, it does actually arise from the local law or from the, uh, from the model text <coughs> in the local law. Um, I suppose, well, I guess this would be directed to the Director of Community Engagement. In the absence of this clause, what are the issues that you would perhaps see arising for your ranges that, uh, that currently exist in the city or potentially would exist in the city? that would require uh, action that this law would not provide us? If, if it was deleted, what are the issues? Because I, I also understand that if someone is parked for more than 24 hours and we do receive a complaint because of the existence of this local law, we have no choice other than to issue an infringement. Is that correct? Uh, through you, Mayor Cole, importantly, as Councillor Gonczewski has pointed out, the, um, the, the rewording of, of part one of this particular clause um, substantially deals with uh, many of the issues we've, we've been facing recently and, and it's acknowledged that um, sections 8.82 B and C uh, do actually address the majority of issues that rangers face in regards to uh, vehicles obstructing, obstructing our thoroughfares. Predominantly they are abandoned vehicles um, which is dealt with by C and um, vehicles in clear waste, um, which is dealt with through B. So realistically, uh, I guess the, the risk or the um, challenge that this will create for rangers is, is probably only in, in two areas. First of all, um, it does sometimes take some time, um, a couple of days, to determine that a vehicle um, is abandoned. Um, unregistered is normally quite easy, but abandoned and disused sometimes does take more than 24 hours for rangers to determine that. Um, without uh, a time specific period. At the moment what the rangers do is chalk the vehicle and put a notice on the vehicle, then they return in 24 hours time. Um, if there is no action being taken then they then make an informed decision as to whether that vehicle should be impounded. Um, without um, part A of this particular clause, the rangers will have to um, either ensure that it's in conflict with a sign, which is quite easy, but they will need to um, determine um, for themselves and be confident that it can be withheld in a court of law that the vehicle is abandoned, unregistered or disused before they do infringe and, and impound the vehicle. So that is the primary risk that's been put forward by rangers. Um, aside from that, uh, as I say, most of the time um, that a, a vehicle is determined to be an obstruction and impounded, it fits in under B and C. So it really is um, that that clause to enable us to take action within a reasonable period of time, if indeed it takes more than 24 hours to determine whether a vehicle has been abandoned or unregistered. Sorry, just a further question now that we're talking about it. Um, can you define what disused 
means in terms of a vehicle and what? <coughs> Yeah, through you, Mayor Cole, it, it, look, it's, it's very similar to, to abandoned. Um, it's where it's clear that the vehicle has been in situ for an extended period of time um, and the owner um, has no intention of um, using it. Normally it's um, either unregistered is, is the prime example, um, but some other examples that the Rangers have provided me is where it's uh, a vehicle that could be almost deemed unroadworthy uh, and therefore it's presumed to be disused or not not have the capability to simply be driven out of that street. So unroadworthy is probably the, um, the, the, the closest description I can give provided um, by the rangers. Uh, sorry, and just for clarity, so you're saying that the 24-hour clause is actually being used as, a, uh, as an adjunct to clause what's currently clause C currently in that if a vehicle, if you talk to tyres, of something that's presumed to be either disused or abandoned, you don't have to prove it because 24 hours later you can remove it because, <coughs> because it sits within the law. So should we not be d defining a time frame in, in Clause C as to what, how, how we, we would determine something to be disused or, uh, as you say, unregistered is easy, but either abandoned or disused rather than making it a catch-all as a separate clause? Because I, I understand both sides, but to me it seems that we're using that clause to, to actually <coughs> determine. And, I, and the concern clearly, as I understand it, is that people who don't like neighbours or otherwise parking for extended periods outside their property or otherwise are able to ring the city and demand that action be taken on the basis of it. Whereas if it's clearly not disused or abandoned, it's just parked there for a long time, it's very different to it having been there for 24 hours. Yes, through you, Mayor Cole. That's where we have tried to improve our local law rather than just rely upon the model local law. The model local law doesn't actually include that, that last clause in relation to abandoned um, or, or disused vehicles. What it does in, in do is just include that 24-hour clause. The issue we've got um, from a ranger's perspective is actually... Um, one, dealing with the abandoned vehicles, but two, dealing with those resident complaints about, and they have been FIFO workers, where a car has been parked illegally for an extended period of time um, and the next-door neighbour wants the vehicle moved. So we've attempted to deal with that by specifying um, what was actually, from what we understand, the intent of that clause in the existing local law, which is actually to deal with abandoned vehicles, not to deal with um, people who... Um, quite legitimately are parking their vehicle in, in a street. So it's where, from our perspective, um, and it's where I don't disagree with Councillor Gonczeszewski's view, B and C um, aspects of this subclause are what is deemed most important from rangers to deal with these current issues um, because we have improved the local law um, as, as opposed to the model. Uh, in our view... A is still a useful mechanism for rangers to have almost a catch-all to deal with those other unusual circumstances, but in terms of the, the issues that we're dealing with on the streets now, um, this proposed am amendment from Councillor Gonczeszewski won't prevent us from dealing with, with the key issues, and I can certainly assure Council that rangers have no intention of infringing or impounding vehicles that are parked illegally by residents who happen to be FIFO workers or, or similar. Just, so just last question. In the event that this is deleted, would it be helpful for what would be the new Clause B so it's where the vehicle is abandoned, unregistered or disused, to add something to there that says uh, something along the lines of uh, and the owner of the vehicle has not responded to a notification from the city within 48 hours, 12 hours, 24, whatever it may be, but actually defining a time period by which if, if there's been no response to, as you said, notice that's left on the vehicle, because it's not just the tyre tire chalking is different to actually leaving a notice on the vehicle, would it not be helpful to... Put a, if this is deleted, to then put a time period so that you still have that catch-all, so that if the notice is put on the vehicle, it can be considered to be disused because they haven't responded within X period of time. Would that be a helpful addition? Through you, Mayor Cole, whilst that would be useful, um, it also is acceptable for administration to simply put in an, an administrative practice to um, support this part of the local law so that, um, from a ranger's perspective, they just simply have a, 
a standard operating procedure in terms of the amount of time or the process they go through to determine what is an abandoned vehicle, which wouldn't be dissimilar to the current process, whereby they chalk, they put a notice on the vehicle, um, they wait for a specific period of time, they make contact with or endeavour to make contact with the owner, the Department of Transport, the police. So for me, it, it more comes down to the administrative practice that we have supporting um, this particular clause of the local law. So um, it would be helpful, but I, I don't think it's essential for administration to administer this local law effectively. Councillor Loden. Just a quick question on this topic. Um, I'm aware that there was an issue um, a couple of years ago of um, car yards parking their cars on um, residential streets and using that as effectively an overflow for their allocated space. On, and I'm just wondering if this was the mechanism that was used to address that concern and or if, if we removed it, would that then be a, a potential problem? Uh, through you, Mayor Cole, I, um, I, I wasn't aware of, of that particular issue. Um, whilst the proposal, or the subclause that's being um, proposed to be deleted um, could indeed be a mechanism to deal with that, um, I'll, I'll need to give it some thought or maybe have a bit of a closer look at the local law, but I would be sure that there would be another um, appropriate uh, clause to deal with that, but I'll need to take that on notice because I wasn't aware of that particular issue. Uh, through you, Mayor. I've got um, thank you for the answers provided from last week's um, briefing. Um, Councillor got... Harley, you Sorry. were the seconder of the amendment, so oh, just clarify, are you asking Sorry. a question? No? Okay. Um, that was a comment. Well, we can go back to the substantives after this. Um, are there any further comments? Um, look, I'd just like to ask some further questions, Director. I completely agree that we need to be able to stop neighbours from using this to ask other neighbours to move on from parking at the front of their houses, which I know from um, being told recently by a resident that this is a course of action that they do take, and I think that that is absolutely not the intention of this clause. But I also do take Councillor Loden's point in that living close to a car yard on Britannia, where residents have complained to me about the fact that cars are parked from the car yard um, almost on a daily, well, on a daily basis and regularly in the same cars until they are, they are sold, but taking up quite a significant amount of parking in the public domain where there are no car parking restrictions. And I'm also wondering how would we potentially deal with an issue where someone potentially came and parked their car in an unrestricted street, potentially caught a bus or a train, uh, maybe made their way to an airport, went on a holiday for, a, uh, say, a month, but had no, um, did not actually live or work in the city of Vincent. What, how would we attempt to deal with those sorts of issues if we remove this 24-hour clause? And is the issue more about the 24 hours or... Um, yeah, I can, I can just foresee issues where we may not potentially have um, a, a necessary tool in the local law to deal with some of the issues that may arise. Yeah, through you, Mayor Cole, for all intents and purposes, as, as long um, if this particular clause was deleted, and I'm, I'm just flicking through the local law to see if there are any other clauses that may assist a, as we speak, but um, my understanding would be that if a a car is not causing obstruction and is parked legally um, in a street with no restrictions, then there is um, nothing that we could do about it from a, from a local law and enforcement perspective. Um, so that is the the specific benefit of, of this subclause being retained within the local law. Um, notwithstanding, my understanding is that there aren't any other clauses that um, will provide uh, that level of, of protection or ability to to enforce the, the car yard sort of example, but um, I will endeavour just to, to look through the local law to see if there are, are any other clauses I'm not aware of, but um, I don't think there is. That that really would be the, the benefit of, of, or one of the benefits of retaining this particular clause. It does just raise a slight concern for me because there have been instances where um, uh, people have raised with me um, the issue of, of car yards having extended parking and taking up an, a number of um, well, 
significant number of bays within the vicinity. That's one issue that, I, that does come to mind and that I have been approached on by uh, residents. Um, I wonder whether it's more an issue of either the 24-hour period or whether Clause A needs to um, deal with the with that this excludes people who reside on the street. I'm just I'm just not sure that um, I just do feel that this is a clause that that is probably useful for some circumstances, and that in the absence of it, um, we may find that we're not able to deal with particular issues that that could cause a bit of stress and um, parking angst on, on unrestricted streets. Through you, Mayor Cole, I, I will add, um, whilst it doesn't necessarily deal with the, the sorts of issues that have been raised with car yards parking um, vehicles on, on streets, there is um, Clause 4.8 within the local law which does uh, pre prevent um, vehicles being in public places and thoroughfares for um, for sale. Um, so that does obviously limit the ability for car yards to um, have the vehicles on streets with, with the sign in the window saying for sale at whatever price, but that doesn't necessarily allow us to deal with those overflow vehicles that are simply parked on a surrounding street until such time as they move back to the car yard. Just if I may ask a question, Mayor, um, in relation to the previous experience around the car yards. Um, I used to have a car yard at the top of my street that did also used to move vehicles out onto the uh, residential street. However, they were simply moved out during the day to provide ease of access for people wanting to drive out and test drive cars or, um, uh, um, or access vehicles. And then at night they were all sort of crammed back into the car yard. Um, so I guess from... Uh, not having knowledge of the, the um, experiences you're talking about, um, the 24-hour provision wouldn't actually have applied in the manner that I'm familiar with. Um, and so I guess I just wondered whether um, that was something that was a factor. Just through you, Mayor Cole, that is a relevant point in terms of the effectiveness of this clause. Um, if the vehicle is simply moved um, in and out of the car yard, um, then, then this, that particular clause wouldn't apply. It is only where a vehicle remains stationary for in excess of 24 hours. Councillor Loden. Um, so the specific issue I was referring to was where the car yard had a greater number of cars than what it could f specifically fit on its lot. So they were doing the practice of pulling them out and then driving them back in, which they're entitled to do, but they were then also leaving them there overnight because they didn't have capacity on their site for all of the vehicles that they actually owned. The CEO would like to make a comment. He will be quick. <laughs> um, thank you, Mayor Cole. Um, Council members, if it's of any value, I think Councillor Gondoshevsky's amendment does point to the heart of this issue, and that is that the provision as it's currently constructed um, measures the obstruction as a matter of time rather than as a matter of physics. So I think that is something for Council to determine and establish a position on. If Council's view is that an obstruction is caused by the duration that something exists in a particular place rather than whether it physically impinges the the through traffic of other vehicles, pedestrians or otherwise, um, then I think that really, that really gets to the crux of, of what this amendment is seeking to address. I, I understand and agree with the various comments that the director has provided and would also just add that um, the recommendation is for council to give statewide public notice of the proposed amendment local law. Um, after submissions have been received, then under the legislation, Council may um, make the local law as proposed and advertised or may alternatively make the local law um, in a manner that's not significantly different from what was proposed or advertised. Um, in my view, given that if it is whether the amendment is adopted substantively or not, the introduction of clause 8.8 .8 would actually provide sufficient scope for Council to add additional criteria after the advertising process of the local law, if Council so decided that that was not significantly altering the local law as was advertised. Thank you, CEO. Are there any further comments on the amendment? OK, I'll put the amendment. All those in favour? Declare it carried. 
Back to the substantive. Are there any comments on the substantive? Okay, I'll put it. Yes, sorry, Councillor Harley, go I had ahead. a couple of um, questions just by way of follow-up from last week. Um, and thank you for the answers in regards to um, the definitions of stopping near, etc. Can I just um, highlight that in, there are, there's parking within and then there's stopping near. And my question is, would it add to um, or remove any ambiguity if you actually added the same metres? So in this case, it's 4.52, I, J and K. <coughs> 5.1, 5.11, 5, 5 5.12.1, if you used the same metrages you've used elsewhere, because if it's, a, it's, if it's an offence to park within one metre of a fire hydrant, I'm assuming it's an offence to stop within one metre of a fire hydrant? Through you, Chair. Uh, through you, Michael. Uh, sorry, just for, for clarity, Councillor Harley, are you talking about the the table in, in terms of the nature of offence at the back of the local law? I beg your pardon, Schedule Two. Yes. So, uh, importantly, the the clauses, uh, the relevant clauses within the the local law, do reference um, the specific. Um, nature of a number of the restrictions. Some of those are, are consistent with the uh, road traffic code in, as required. Uh, there are indeed some vehicles that um, are allowed to park within um, a closer distance, for example, taxis and buses. Uh, so importantly, um, whilst I can certainly uh, look at that, the, the clauses within the local law are the most relevant aspect when um, assessing what near means or the distance from a particular intersection. It is uh, somewhat of an abridged or a summarised version in terms of the nature of offence in the table at the back of the local law. Sorry, my final question relates to the hydrant um, signposting around the city. And is that um, DFES who are responsible for maintaining that or the City of Vincent? And I ask that because um, um, having just noticed quite a lot of it over the weekend, including on um, a place where I own a property, the signage is um, largely faded and you would be hard pressed to see the faded painted hydrant sign at night or even during the day. Um, and is this something that, if it's us or DFES that need to maintain this, is this something that if it's an offence to be near um, that fire hydrant, then we actually mark that out on the road because I think we've got probably a lot of people inadvertently parking right across fire hydrants. Through you, Mayor Cole, I have just confirmed with the Acting Director of Technical Services that it is actually DFES who's responsible for the signage uh, and the line marking. Uh, certainly something I'm happy to look at with uh, the Acting Director given the fact that from an enforcement perspective, the, uh, the quality and the legibility of the signage and the line marking is crucial, um, not just when issuing infringements, but certainly if um, we're required to defend those infringements um, in court. So certainly happy to take that on board and follow it up with DFES as required. I'm happy to send you some locations of ones I saw. Thank you. Um, unless there are any further questions? I'll put the motion. All those in favour? I declare it carried unanimously. Okay, we're now moving um, to item 10.2, which is proposed parking restrictions in Broom Street, Highgate between Smith and Lord Streets. A mover for this item. Councillor Buckles seconded Councillor Loden. Thank you, Mayor. I, am, I don't have any comments on this. Happy to support it. Councillor Loden, any councillors wish to speak to this item? Okay, I'll put it. All those in favour? Declare it carried. waiting on Councillor Toppelberg and Councillor Murphy to return to the chamber. Uh, 
Uh, we're now moving on to motions of which previous notice has been given. The first motion is 14.1, Notice of Motion, Councillor Jonathan Hallett, to investigate reduction or elimination of single-use plastics. Do I have a mover for this item? Councillor Lowden, seconder? No, no seconder. <laughs> Councillor Murphy? Yes. Oh, sorry, did I say Councillor Murphy? It must be the facial hair, I apologise. <laughs> so moved by Councillor Hallett, seconded by Councillor Murphy. Thank you. Thank you. Um, just a quick comment. Um, we've talked in this chamber um, a few times about the scourge of single-use plastic, single plastic bags um, in particular, and um, we, I guess, monitor with interest um, the progression of a statewide um, ban on these. Um, we're also a big supporter of Plastic Free July, um, which is a great initiative supporting the community to reduce plastic um, usage in their own lives. Um, what this motion looks to do is turn that gaze inwards towards the operations of the city itself um, and so, and to also expand beyond single-use plastic bags to other forms of single-use um, plastic. So um, this motion looks to, um, I guess, piggyback on a number of other reviews that are happening within the city, keep single-use plastics on the radar um, to identify opportunities to reduce where possible and if eliminate um, if practicable. Um, so, and reporting back to the council during budget considerations next year so that we can consider, in light, I guess, of advice driven out of Imagine Vincent around opportunities to build sustainability initiatives within the council, um, what we might want to look for at in the next year. Thank you, Councillor Murphy. Yeah, look, I um, support this uh, proposal. I do have a slight wording um, amendment that I did want to put forward, um, and that is around, uh, just in my investigation around uh, plastic, sometimes it is actually more efficient and less impactful on the environment to use plastic um, in terms of recycling. So our current recycling for glass, for instance, um, uh, it's more negative impact uh, in recycling glass <clears throat> because we may have to send it away or we don't actually recycle it. Um, so in some instances it may actually be more efficient to um, recycle uh, plastic rather than <clears throat> um, glass or other uh, substances. So although I do um, wholly agree with um, the proposal, I did want to perhaps um, well, I did want to actually propose a, a slight wording amendment, so where it says um, identify mechanisms available to encourage or prescribe a reduction or elimination of single-use plastics, I, I would like to add where viable and less negatively impactful upon the environment to do so. <clears throat> Just, and I do notice in the um, administration's comments that they did make mention um, where viable, um, but I thought that we should probably put that into the... Um, the wording of the motion, if that's okay. Councillor Murphy, would you like to just read through your proposed amendment again, just so that Emma can capture it? Yes. Yeah, so after, uh, where are we? So after identify mechanisms available to encourage or prescribe a reduction or elimination of single-use plastics, uh, put where viable <clears throat> and less negative negatively impactful upon the environment to do so. Yeah. Yeah. Could I suggest, Councillor Murphy, that you don't need the three words to do so? Oh, yeah. Yes, thank you. Okay. Great. Yeah. Great. Do I have a seconder for the amendment? Councillor Hallett, thank you. Um, do you wish to speak further to the amendment, Councillor Murphy? No, thanks. Councillor Hallett? Um, no, I support the amendment. It captures the spirit of uh, the motion. Any further? I, I have oh, yes? a question about what does where viable means and who measures it and how? Uh, well, um, the administration, um, in the administration comments, uh, they suggested we're viable, so maybe I'll throw over to um, <laughs> through the chair. Yes, through the mayor. Um, the proposal is for 
initially the city to investigate where it uses single-use plastics and then from there to investigate the various options for reducing the use of that plastic in the first instance um, or the other alternatives and costs and benefits of, of doing those alternatives, then to present that to the EAG, the Environmental Advisory Group, for their comment. So they will certainly be part of that process to determine what is viable and whether it's of benefit or not. Um, and then it will be presented to Council as part of the budget considerations for Council to consider the viability of those options. So that's a financial viability question because it might cost the city um, extra in order to provide a more environmentally sensitive um, option. Um, and it's also um, viability in, in resourcing and the actual providing the product itself. So we might, we might decide not to provide a product anymore at all um, because of the environmental cost. So that would certainly be determined by the council with advice from EAG and administration. Thank you. Any further comments? Yes, sir. Councillor Gondosevsky on the amendment. Uh, just, I, I sort of agree with, I do agree with Councillor Harley in relation to viability. I um, wonder if the, I, I would hesitate to think that um, mechanisms that um, had been identified would not be actually presented or included in the um, investigation results um, when presented to um, the EAG or council on the basis of viability in terms of what is easy or what is possible within the current um, resources. Um, however, um, so I, I can't amend a proposed amendment, can I? Just to, to say considering viability and impact on the environment rather than where less, where viable. Um, I may turn to the CEO for this. It would really be at the um, at the <coughs> will of the move uh, of the amendment and seconder to accept a, a change to this amendment. If if that's not accepted, then it will come down to voting against the amendment and proposing a further amendment. So, Councillor Murphy, the suggestion is is that the wording would be Councillor Gondoshevsky. Can you just repeat? Identify mechanisms available to encourage or prescribe a reduction or elimination of, an elimination of single-use plastics, um, considering viability and impact on the environment. That sounds almost exactly the same, but in a different tense. Is it just me? <laughs> Could I just make a quick comment on, on the item while we're doing the words? I just... Like as a as a sustainability advisor in a fellow local government to ours, I just wanted to advise that I don't. I'm, I'm happy to support the amendment, but I don't actually think that the wording of the amendment or suggestions otherwise will have any impact whatsoever on the way this action gets implemented by the administration. But you know, the city of Vincent loves a detailed discussion. <laughs> No, well, this is a well. This is an opportune moment, Councillor Buckles. I think we're happy to support the um, suggested change. Okay, so All right, we're going with the um, with the alternative wording. Are there any further comments on the amendment? Yes, three yes. chair. I really applaud, applaud Councillor Gondoszewski's efforts to change those words, but I, uh, I actually don't think, not only do I not think it makes a difference, I actually think that it places some parameters around what it is we're asking this group to do, and on that basis I'm not going to support any amendment to the wording that's in front of us. Thank you, Councillor Harley. Any further comments on the amendment? Okay, I'll put it. All those in favour of the amendment? All those against? I declare it carried. Councillor Harley voting against. Back to the substantive. Are there any comments on the substantive? Yes, yes Chair. Councillor um, Harley. I, um, look, I'm going to support this motion, but I'm actually going to speak against it, ironically, because I, I support it. Well, because actually, uh, so I'll put my, you know, they're not major concerns, but I think we had a pretty simple um, number two. It was a pretty simple motion. And then what we've done, in my view, is then 
seek to add some constraints. <coughs> the First Amendment added uh, about viability and, in, and less impact. I mean, I actually just think that that is the work that we're asking this group to do is to go away and identify all the mechanisms that are available to us and then bring them back to a council forum or whatever forum we wish to have this in and for us to have this discussion and um, whether they are viable or not, for us to have this discussion about um, what we are prepared to pay, just like we are prepared to perhaps incur short-term costs in regards to how we, um, uh, how we invest our money, um, how we do purchasing, a range of things. Sometimes there is cost involved with doing what we believe is the long-term right thing. So it's, it's no big deal. I just don't think that either of the wording options and the one that we've just um, adopted add anything, and I actually think they provide um, parameters on this investigation that aren't necessary. Thank you, Councillor Harley. Are there any further comments? Um, look, I'd, you'll close the debate, Councillor Harley, so I would like to just comment that um, um, I'm very pleased that the city is this year doing a waste strategy, and it's really timely because you know we're looking. This is this really forms part of it. This is this is a subset of of a much broader investigation into how we deal with our waste at the city of Vincent, and I do applaud and support this motion. But I think that also there are things that come that um, become presented to you that just seem so elementary and basic, but yet the city still is not completely getting it right. And I'm talking about my experience at the Mount Hawthorne Primary School Disco on Friday night, where um, after um, doing a shift there with the PNC and being told by, well, kind of almost screamed at by five members of the PNC that there was no recycling bins at the Braithwaite Hall for the copious amounts of glass, aluminium cans and um, plastics that were used at the disco, I think, well, look, there's an example of um, something that is so basic and so um, so necessary that we that we are not providing that service. That it was, you know, I, I did say, look, I apologise. I I can completely see this uh, is a very wasteful, and this is something that we will be dealing with through our waste strategy. So there's so many levels of um, opportunity that present um, through our waste strategy, and uh, it is just so timely and so needed. Um, that it's you know it's great that we're having this discussion and it will be fantastic to correct some of those more basic things as well that we just really need to to get right. So very keen um, for us to push on with the waste strategy on that holistic overview of how we can better um, deal with our waste across Vincent. <coughs> also just to mention that I did think it was um, really good to see in the responses provided from the briefing by administration that. Um, in terms of plastic bags and our use of dog waste bags that in the past we have attempted to use compostable dog bags which did start to break down uh, um, whilst um, sitting around our ovals in their dispenser and it did result in some unfortunate incidents at the time of collect waste being collected but that, that is now being um, revisited and um, we hope that there's been some advances in the market so that that's something the administration is looking into again so that was also great to see given that we are promoting a um, plastic bag ban within the city of Vincent so we, we um, must take our own action in terms of our own single use plastic bags that we provide. So just a couple of comments, but otherwise I'm very happy to see this body of work happen as part of our waste strategy and I support the motion. Councillor Hallett, did you wish to close debate? Okay, I'll put the motion. All those in favour? I declare it carried unanimously. Um, on to motion 14.2, notice of motion from Councillor Susan Gontoshevsky, strategies to improve participation and accessibility by women and girls at the City of Vincent sports grounds and associated facilities. Yeah. Councillor Gondoshevsky, do you wish to move? Uh, yes. Seconder? Councillor Toppelberg. Um, look, I won't take up much time. I um, would just like to note I, I think our sports grounds and facilities are an important component of the city's public open space and some of our significant assets. Um, I think that um, local government has a role to play in ensuring equitable access to these facilities. I'm really supportive of the work that the city is currently undertaking with our sporting clubs um, in terms of our health checks and reviewing, um, looking at membership and, and obtaining player data. 
And I think that um, having a look at this by gender will be um, valuable when considering options for sports ground fees and charges, um, and that will be presented later this year. Um, I think. Um, I think we see across the board at Vincent that um, we're seeking to be informed by uh, the data and I think that's um, absolutely um, the grounding of good local government decision making. So, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Toppleberg. Nothing to say? Anyone? Councillor Buckleberg? Just, so, just a quick Buckles. question, uh, not really a question, but a comment on it. I guess um, it might turn into a question. I'm just wondering whether as part of this looking at sporting club membership details by gender, et cetera, et cetera. Do we, whether we have, I will make a question through to the relevant, relevant director, which I think will be director of community services. Um, in terms of, do we have any data about not so much the sports clubs and whether they have girls in, involved, but girls who live in Vincent, whether they're involved with sporting clubs elsewhere? And I guess the only thing that just to, is that as an example, like we host the rugby on, on Saturday mornings at Britannia, which is an ongoing issue, but there's an awful lot of people from around areas come in and then we've actually had a way of charging um, differential, differential um, levies to clubs externally who don't have a lot of Vincent people in it. And just noting that one of the interesting things with one of the most popular girl sports um, or two of the most popular girls' sports, which would be basketball and netball, not wanting to stereotype what sports people play, but they would be significantly hosted by other local governments. So, for example, a lot of girls in Vincent would play at Matthews Netball Centre. I'm not aware whether Vincent residents or the Matthews Netball Centre would pay higher rates for accommodating an awful lot of Vincent residents in the city of Cambridge there, or basketball at Perry Lakes, for example, where I know a lot of kids play, play basketball. At. So do we, do we have any stats on female participation in sports, which might be a useful um, aside so that we can get a bigger picture of not just, obviously I do believe that there is an issue with some sporting clubs not necessarily opening themselves to female sports participation as they should do, but also just trying to actually hone in on the issue as to do, is, uh, do we have I don't know if young girls in Vincent feel that there is no way that they can play they can play sports. So it would be nice to. I'm trying to sound not like a complete sexist old prick here, but you know what I mean. I'm trying to. I'm just trying to make sure that we're targeting what is required. Sorry, my language there. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm gone in October. I don't have to worry about these things. Yeah. Would you like to answer that question, Director? <laughs> Could you please repeat the question? Uh, uh, through you, Mayor Cole. Uh, the, 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 the city is uh, bereft of stats, I think it's fair to say. So we have very limited information, which is why the club health checks, understanding what the current makeup of our sporting club's membership is, how many they have, um, how old they are, and what the, the male-female split was the obvious starting point. There is. Um, Australian and, and state level participation statistics available, but it doesn't really tell much of a story about what's happening in Vincent. So uh, it is correct that we need to uh, develop those stats as the basis for good decision making. We're starting with the club health check so we can start to understand the trends in terms of how our sporting clubs are, are growing and, and, and what their membership looks like, but we do have very limited stats available at the moment. And again, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm gone in two months, but um, segue, I think that it will, just to speak on this a bit further, it may be useful in the future, once we've got this sort of information, to actually try and survey and engage with the young people in Vincent to find out what sports facilities we do or don't offer internally and what they do or don't have access to, so we can really figure out what, what there is a need for within Vincent, because I think we probably, you know, once we look at what we, what we do, there's probably a whole heap of sports, and, and I I completely agree, especially towards young, young female players that are not really presented really well in Vincent. So it would be useful to maybe engage with that community to, to find out what they, what they would actually like. Thank you, Councillor Buckles. Are there any further comments in relation to the motion? Okay, I'll put it. All those in favour? Declare it carried unanimously. Now moving on to the last item before we head into confidential which is 14.3, Notice of Motion, Mayor Emma Cole, Reaffirmation of Support for Marriage Equality. Do I have a mover and seconder for this item? Moved Councillor Murphy, seconded Councillor Hallett. 
um, I strongly support this uh, motion. Um, uh, I don't have much else to say, actually, other than um, I think that the, the uh, having a flying the rainbow flag in front of the city of Vincent is a really nice touch. Um, I think it uh, really advertises the fact of where we stand um, as a, a council who has, um, for many years now, <clears throat> supported marriage equality um, through our marriage uh, register, and um, I think, yeah, full support of the motion. Councillor Hallett. Uh, I'd like to thank the Mayor and um, other councillors for the leadership that they've shown around um, this issue previously. And I also just want to kind of comment, focused on the rainbow flag flying um, component as a visible sign of support for the LGBTI members of our community. Um, we've already seen some, a start of some pretty offensive and hurtful things that have been said about queer relationships and families as the survey goes ahead and it's likely to get worse. Uh, this process is likely to be pretty awful for members of our community, for young people who are still questioning their sexuality and their self-worth because of it, and for older members of our community that only too clearly remember the level of vitriol directed towards them during previous law reform. Queer folk are a pretty resilient bunch given what we're exposed to, but there's limits. When you're discriminated against by law and bombarded with stigmatising commentary legitimised by some members of our parliaments, it can get a bit rough. And that stigma is why almost one in five LGBTI people report current suicidal thoughts, and it's no surprise that the queer community has the highest rates of suicide of any group in the developed world. So seeing public symbols like a rainbow flag outside a local government office reminds us that we're not alone and is a pretty special um, thing to pass. Thanks. Thank you, Councillor Hallett. Are there any further comments? Councillor Buckles? Uh, yeah, look, it's a, you know, small gestures that we're doing, but I think it is really important that um, the City of Vincent does take this strong stance and is a sort of a within our own community a bit, a community a bit of a beacon for support for marriage equality so that people because I think as Councillor Harder has said the, the tone of debate online is is getting pretty feral and there's an awful lot of comments there's a lot of nasty stuff going going on there and I just think that people engaging in that will one may possibly vote no because they're being told that that is what they should vote because there's some really twisted but strangely possibly compelling to some minds arguments being put out there because there's all sorts of little segues and tangents trying to take it away from the core the core debate and I think that you know what City of Vincent can do is basically present a, a positive voice in, in the debate here because I think um, and try and keep it out of the mire. Jeez. Thank you. Any further comments? Yeah, through you, Mayor. Um, just really to take the opportunity, um, echo their sentiments, but also um, I'm, I'm sure I won't speak on behalf of everyone, but um, through the administration, I guess just to let staff know um, that the support they have from council, those staff who are um, affected by this either as um, same-sex couples or partners in same-sex couples, but um, parents and loved ones of people who um, are going to be going through this process as well. So if I'm um, not sure I need an amendment or a motion, just nod heads if you agree. Thank you. Any further comments? I'll make some comments. Look, I think that um, the City of Vincent has had a really clear and strong position since 2012 when our relationship declaration register was brought into effect um, under Mayor, former Mayor Lana McTiernan. Um, and that was really because there was no option available for same-sex couples who are in a committed relationship to make a declaration and to have acknowledgement. And so the City of Vincent provided that not only to our own residents and ratepayers, but across Western Australia. And while it's a bit of a shadow of um, what marriage um, is and, and offers to same-sex couples, we have over, over the years had 32 same-sex couples who have come and, and proudly declared that they're in a committed relationship and made use of that declaration register. So I'd say there's 32 great reasons of, for the City of Vincent um, to do that. And I think just um, even for those who haven't taken it up, for the City to take that position and to say you're welcome here, we support you and we recognise your relationship um, in, a, in a formal way, I think that that was a very powerful message at that time. We then followed up in 2014 with an official um, marriage equality proclamation, which was really just a sort of formalisation of a position
position that the city had already effectively taken through our relationship declaration register. And um, I think that for many people this um, non-binding postal survey is a deeply worrying time. It's a it's um it's highly un it's a highly unusual proposition all round to really make us a, a, a section of our community have to really um, go through what is a very deeply personal um, you know thing for them to sort of come under such scrutiny and to really question whether they um, deserve um, equal rights to marriage equality. In terms of the city of Vincent's role, I think we have a very powerful role in terms of standing up with our community and saying that we do strongly support equality, diversity and human rights in our community. And it's not about launching into a political campaign, but it's about actually showing our community that we do celebrate diversity, that we do support our LG sorry, LGBTIQ+, as some like to call it, community, and that we, um, I think that these symbols are very important in what can be a very tough time for that community for us to actually say, we stand with you, we support you, we believe that you deserve equal rights, and we know that we do have a strong community within Vincent. Um, we are a regular supporter of um, Pride, and we, um, we, we know that um, there are a lot of people in our community that fully support the position that Vincent has taken since 2012, whether they are in a same-sex relationship or whether they are not. Um, I'd just like to state that in, in addition to flying the rainbow flags, the city will be taking a few other symbolic um, gestures throughout this time. Um, we'll be looking at potentially having a flag-raising ceremony um, which um, probably have to be organised at short notice, but we potentially could be doing that on Thursday morning if this motion is adopted, which we will publicly advertise. We are looking at um, replacing our street banner poles on Scarborough Beach Road, which were due for replacement. We do replace them quarterly, and we often put community messages up there. So we will be having a Vincent Loves Love campaign, and that will be... Um, looking at replacing the street banner poles there, um, having some T-shirts which staff and councillors can choose to wear. Um, we will um, also be having um, the staff's casual dress Friday. Where the proceeds will be going to Living Proud, which is based in the city of Vincent and who support the welfare of the LGBTIQ plus community. And just of note um, that we will also be having a local choir who are made up of LGBTIQ um, IQ singers um, at our citizenship ceremony on the 13th of September 2017. That's a happy coincidence, but just another way of celebrating our wonderful, diverse community. So um, we'll also be talking to some of our same-sex couples that have um, made a relationship um, declaration and seeing whether they would like to talk about their stories through social media. And um, we will be offering, potentially be offering um, local businesses um, rainbow colours to display over their lighting in their stores and we'll be looking to do that also in the library and local history centre. So the message is really that Vincent loves love. It's not about um, running a political campaign but it's about supporting our community and being clear about who we are and who we represent as a council and as a community. Any further comments? Okay, I'll put the motion. All those in favour? And declare it carried. Thank you. Um, we're about to move in camera for the confidential part of our meeting, so um, we will just have to ask our members of the public gallery and the media to um, leave, and we thank you for your presence this evening. Thank you, Councillor Tobelberg is moving that we move to the confidential part of the meeting. Seconded, Councillor Loden. All those in favour? I declare it carried. We've just resumed live web streaming of the meeting so that um, I can report back on a decision of Council in relation to a confidential item, which was 18.1, partial write-off of rates owing for Perth Mosque development at, 44, sorry, at 433 William Street, Perth. 
um, and the um, decision of council is that council approve the write-off of $27,836.99 of back rates and $6,265.78 penalty interest owing on the 2014 Perth Mosque Inc. development at 433 William Street, Perth, due to a partial rates exemption granted in accordance with section 6.26 bracket 2 bracket, bracket D of the Local Government Act 1995. So that concludes the meeting for this evening and I would declare the meeting closed at three minutes to nine o'clock. Thank you.